So you said yes. Somebody from the church came by and said, hey, we need more volunteers for our children's ministry. And for some reason, moment of weakness, you said, why, yes, I'll do that. I can help out with that. And now that you're into it, you're coming up with all kinds of reasons why you probably need to get out of it. There are people who are more qualified than you. You know that. You really don't have time for this. I mean, you've got bills to pay and jobs to do. And besides, there are other ministries that you would be more qualified for. Maybe that's what you're thinking. Or maybe you're just delighted with what's going on in the ministry and ready to keep at it. Wherever you are, let me just give you this word of encouragement. For those of you excited about what's going on, I have the same word of encouragement. For those of you that aren't sure that you can keep going on, here it is. Let me start with an interesting statistic. Did you know? Yeah, you probably did. 83% of every human being that comes to Christ does so between the ages of 4 and 14. Let me say that again. 83% of all Christians convert between the ages of 4 and 14. Simply put, there is no more effective ministry in the entire church than children's ministry. Four out of five people who ever come to Christ do so in this ministry of the church. Folks, that's just that's just hitting with the thick side of the bat. You, you aren't going to do anything more effective than this. You aren't going to plow any row straighter or deeper than this. It's not going to bear more fruit than this. Not only do children come to Christ in droves during this period. So do their parents who are driving them to church. Here's the deal. Often young parents sense this need to be uh, spiritual guides for their children's lives, but they, they aren't spiritually oriented themselves. They don't have church background. So it is during this time of young parenthood that they are most open to bringing their children to church. And during that season, 4 to 14, they have more interaction with Christians than they will ever have again in their lives. Not only does children's ministry reach children, children's ministry reaches the parents of children. Here's something else that Solomon discovered back in Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he won't depart from it. Now, that's obviously a proverb, not a promise. So you can't say that every child that goes to Sunday school is going to die a believer. But you can say this, that statistically, the probability is far greater that one will die and go to heaven if they've lived as a child in Sunday school. Modern psychologists have confirmed what Solomon discovered, that the Deepest values in our lives come from what we were taught as children. By the time a child is four, five, six years old, their thinking patterns about morality are already established. If we can intersect with a child during these pivotal years of four to 14, that even if they have a season of wandering, the likelihood that they will return to their Christian roots in adulthood is very, very strong. There simply is no more effective ministry in the church than this. There's something I want to encourage you with too, because I know that if you are having some of those questions about your own effectiveness or if this matches your gift set or whatever's going through your head, then perhaps you need to remember this kind of axiom of ministry. It's guided me in over 20 years of teaching. It's simply this, that children who are unlovely, and let me pause there, there are children who are unlovely. <laughs> in fact, you can put names and faces to them. That little kid with ADD, that little girl who throws a tantrum, the one who gossips, the one who steals toys, the one who writes with permanent marker on the whiteboard. They're everywhere. Back to the rule of life. Children who are unlovely are not unlovely because they're unlovable, but because they're unloved. Let me say it again. Children who are unlovely are not unlovely because they're unlovable, but because they are unloved. 
I want to tell you a story about Billy. That is not his real name. He is a very real person. I can assure you that. He drove me crazy. Now, I, I teach at the college level. And so you shouldn't have college level students acting like four to 14 year olds. But trust me, I understand children's ministry well. This guy, every day in class. When I took role, I would call his name, Billy. Mm. He would always respond, never the same way. And it was always something childish and stupid. Sometimes he would stand up on his desk and shout out, Oh, Captain, my Captain. Uh, mildly entertaining, I suppose, but very irritating at the same time. One day, he had just gotten to me, and he was absent from class that day. Or at least, so I thought. And I hate to confess this, but there was something inside me that said, Oh, good, I won't have to deal with him today. That's just how shallow I am. If you can relate, then God bless you. As I called his name with some unstated and hopefully hidden relish, I, I thought I would be met with silence. I was not. He answered, here, from underneath my desk, where he had been hiding. Now, this is a sophomore in college. I chastised him, of course, appropriately, sent him back to his seat and said, Billy, don't ever do that again. And the Holy Spirit began to chastise me. He said, you don't even know him. How can you not like him if you don't know him? Ask him out to lunch. Well, I don't need to tell you, I suppose, that the last thing on my agenda was going out to lunch with Billy. He just irritated the fire out of me. But if you've ever had a discussion with the Holy Spirit, you know that I lost. And at lunch, I asked Billy but one question. Dude, what's your story? And he began to unpack for me a series of abuse and neglect that shamed me. And I realized that day that had I been through half of what Billy had been through, I would not be half the man that Billy was. And the Lord taught me that day, people are not unlovely because they're unlovable, but because they're unloved. Look, there's no magic ending to Billy's life. He struggled through college. He did get his degree. I got to meet his parents at graduation. Oh, my word. Now, I'm not saying that loving somebody is, is a magic fix. But for me, it went a whole long way to loving this student that really needed my love. And if you have some students that are unlovely, they are the most important ones in your class. Or perhaps I should better say it this way. If you have unlovely students, to them, you are the most important person in their life. If you can but love them when nobody else does, you can make a permanent change. And that, my friends, is hitting with a thick end of the bat. Let me pray with you. Lord, we have this incredible opportunity to invest in people's lives at pivotal moments, at key junctures. And for everyone hearing my voice right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower them to teach the gospel to the least and the lost, the most vulnerable and the most receptive. I pray that your Holy Spirit would sustain them with their own billies, with their own trials, with their own schedules and with their own frustrations. Holy Spirit, we call on you to complete the work of the teaching ministry of the church for the lives of children, for the glory of God, and for the fame of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.